And we're live in three, two. Welcome, folks, to another episode of the Planet Mullins podcast. I've got a New Yorker today. From, yes, sir. Uh, from Freeville. <clears throat> and that's right. I think that's not far from Freebird, New York. No, that's a different story. <laughs> Please say hello to Lonnie Park, an amazing producer and uh, somebody who's just crushing it out there. How's it going today, Lonnie? It's going well. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. Absolutely, man. I, I started looking over some of your credits and your bio stuff, and it's pretty amazing what you've been able to accomplish. I mean, uh, new age, jazz, children's, world gospel, country, folk, progressive metal, lots of great genres in there. Three Grammys, four Grammy nominations, the Golden Peace Song Award, Golden Music Award, multiple Sammy Awards and the United Nations Action Award. So when I read over that, I thought, man, I got like, you know, Grammy royalty in here, but what the heck is a Sammy Award? Is that when, you know, Sammy Davis <laughs> Jr.'s Sammy Davis Jr.'s hologram comes and says, yeah, Lonnie, that was really swinging. Can't wait to tell Frank. No, right. Uh, just north of me is a city called Syracuse. Okay. And Syracuse is like right in the center of the state. And they do a music award that, you know, exceptions um, New York City and yeah. really encompasses on central New York. And it's the, they call it the Syracuse Area Music Award. So um, Sammy's for short after all the abbreviations. Uh, but it's a great organization and they really do a great job. And there's a lot of Grammy winners that have won Sammy's as well. Man, that's that's fascinating. I, I see... Um... You know, one of the guys that I really enjoy watching their show is uh, Rick Beato. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably know Rick because I think he's from up around that area. And I see you've got this beautiful wall of guitars up there. Are you mostly a guitarist then as far as how you started out? By necessity, mostly. I, I really started on piano. Nice. I grew up in a house where my mother played piano, my sister played piano, and my dad played a little guitar. It was all about gospel and hymns and a very, very conservative home. And so I just, there was a piano in the house and I just learned heart and soul from a, a babysitter. And that was kind of what started everything. You know, the stuff that I learned from my babysitter, I can't talk about on a podcast. <laughs> but, you know, the piano was a central thing in, a, in my uh, family too, because my mom played piano in a Baptist church. So she was always getting in trouble for jazzing it up with a stride left hand. And they would have these conferences. Do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like we went to the same kind of Baptist church. Uh, I think we did. And then, you know, obviously you work with clients that have every possible type of genre, belief system, personal history. Right. Is that something that's a challenge for you to manage? Cause I, I know that you just recently got a Grammy for, um, Ricky Cage, who's from India, and Stuart Copeland, the drummer from the police, for producing that album was was that one of the I mean, I just saw that and I thought, wow, man, that Lonnie must have had a great time doing that. What was that experience like? That was incredible. Uh, it starts with my relationship with Ricky Cage. We work together constantly and have for many years. Wow. Um, and that that relationship's just grown and we become like brothers outside of the music as well, but really in the music business, we really clicked so well. And so we've done many, many albums, many projects, singles, uh, concerts all around the world together. I front his band um, when we tour. Wow. And so when this, this uh, record divine tides started to happen, Ricky and I already had a great workflow and Stuart was just absolutely amazing to work with. And the fact that it uh, it did well is a real big bonus, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't do any better than winning the Grammy for that album. But conceptually, did they come to you with a concept of it? They said the album is called Divine Tides. Here are the songs. And Lonnie, you got to, you know, pull it together. Did they both come to your studio and work or did you have to do this during the pandemic or how did it go it was, down? It was during the pandemic. Wow. So Ricky and I, are, obviously, Ricky lives in India. Right. I live in central New York, where my nearest neighbor's about a mile away. Okay. Uh, so we were really used to working remote anyway. And then Got the it. pandemic hit, really nothing changed other than we stopped touring. 
Okay. And then, of course, Stuart's got an amazing studio at home. And so Imagine. all his contributions, he was able to handle right at home as well. So it was it was definitely a, an amazing experience. That was a continuation, again, of Ricky and I's um, work that we've been doing for a long time. Uh, and, of course, Stuart being the uh, the centerpiece of, of the album was just incredible. You know, Stuart, when I was a kid, I wasn't, you know, I was at the Baptist church. Right. <laughs> I went to a Baptist school as well. So, Oh, wow. You were listen. deep in it. Oh, yeah, man. I was all the way in. And so I wasn't allowed to listen to music with drums let alone secular music with drums. So wow. I remember in high school, I was going to this Baptist school and I had a friend that went to the public school. Okay. And he came to me and he said, what's wrong with rock and roll? Of course, I drank the Kool-Aid all the way down and I'd be, I'd be happy to tell you what's wrong and evil about rock and roll. And he said, all right, I'm going to give you an album and I want you to listen to it and I want you to tell me what's wrong with it. And he gave me police synchronicity. <laughs> and I took that thing home and I remember telling Stuart the story uh, I took it home and I opened up my notebook and I started writing and by the time that record was done I had all kinds of things that were wrong with that record of course I was wrong um, and I, I revisit that story every so often <laughs> full circle. and then later in my rock and roll career doing the very stuff that I wasn't allowed to even listen to to wow. get to work with Stuart it was just, it's surreal. And to have him become, instead of this iconic, untouchable character in my life, he became a very tangible, normal human being that I'm doing music with like anybody else. And it was just absolutely amazing. So would he record uh, parts on, on the drum kit at his home studio and send you stems to the drums yeah. to these tunes? Is that yeah. how you start? Because I've always liked... Uh, unless it's a free flowing improv kind of thing. I always like having a drum track to work with as a foundation. Did the drum tracks happen first on this or how did it go down? Um, it varied a bit, okay. uh, but really Stuart's Stuart did a fantastic job of taking in the music and doing his interpretation and spitting out his performances. So, you know, it's, there's not one specific workflow, so to speak, Mm -hmm. as it rolls so it's not like we laid the drums first and all that um it's really this process that every song's unique but Stuart's also got this amazing collection of percussion instruments from around the world mm. that he was able to incorporate of course everything in his studio is all mic'd up and ready to go right right so all these exotic instruments and then traditional drums and is what he brought to this album was amazing that's incredible. I had Ricky on uh, the show and uh, he's quite the character, that guy, Ricky Cage. He's a, yeah. he's hilarious. He just posted on his Facebook a picture of one of his early studios. And the thing that I noticed the most about his, and it was, I don't know, 30 years ago, but what I noticed the most was like the black uh, Naga hide or leather couch in the back of the studio. Yeah, the classic. And I said, "Hey, next time I want to have your couch on, <laughs> Joe, because I want to hear the stories about the couch." But it, you know, all of us in the studio business started humbly and then worked their way up. I mean, how did you, um, you know, work your way up to having a studio like the one that you've got now? Did you just do it over years and keep on buying more gear and investing and moving and building on, or how? Yeah, and you know, the needs for um, what you need in your studio changes over the years. I, when I started, it was analog tape and big giant consoles and a million microphones. And every time you wanted a piano player to play in your on your record, you had to fly him in or bring him in regionally if you could. Right. Uh, so I've been recording since my teens. Uh, I never had the privilege of working in a massive studio because there weren't really any around here that oh. I had that opportunity for. So I, along the way, just started growing. I started with a four track cassette. Then I moved to an eight track reel to reel. Then a yeah, man. Reel -to -reel, and then off to the eight ats and stacks of eight ats. And then finally to computer recording and DAWs and pro tools now, ultimately. Uh -huh. um, so it's just been this constant growth. I'm 54 right now. Um, I started in my teens. So 
you know, it's evolved. Even how we record, I no longer need this giant live room because people don't come here that often to record something large. Uh -huh. So when I built this studio, um, I really worked with the concept of remote recording with the ability to have a few people tracking here. I love it's it when there's a, when you can have several people or a large group of people in a room though. I mean, it's still, oh, it's it doesn't happen as often. Uh, I used to work at a studio at Selma and Wilcox in Hollywood called Wide Tracks. Mm -hmm. And they had two portions to this, to the uh, building there. One of them was a um, gangster rap label called Par Records and Priority did a bunch of stuff there. And that was all thuggy and crazy. And yeah. I was a young white guy scared mm -hmm. out of my wits. And then the other side of it was uh, Wayne Henderson and the Crusaders studio. So we would be in that room there and we're getting ready to do a, a project like a Ronnie Laws record. And we'd have two guitar players. We'd have Craig T. Cooper and uh, Doc Powell or uh, Ray Fuller and um, Bubba Bryant on the drums. Wilton Felder in there on sax and a lot of times oh. on bass. And Wilton and I were you know, good friends for the last 40 years of his life and just the energy in the room even the ground hum it's like you know the, the ground hum becomes a part of a thing do you think it's funny now that everything is so pristine and clear that you can actually buy these plugins for your pro tools that have ground hum and noise and all that oh yeah they've done a fantastic job of <laughs> in the junk and you know it's funny that's a part of the sound like you said it's all so a lot of those imperfections and noise, the, we figured it out as we went into digital, we got everything so pristine that it felt sterile. So now right. these plugins are really, they're starting to adapt some of the things that made the sound special, which was noise and various noises and grounds. And uh, so it's good to keep some of that in there anyway. And you still have the ability to pull it out now. Digital, right. But at least it's there to give it that real feel. Well, do you um since you've toured with ricky um apparently for such a long time do you have a favorite gig that you guys have done so far because i see i mean i don't know if you know this or not but i i uh you know work in internet marketing and i'm online all the time i saw ricky posting pictures of himself on the cover of gq yeah yeah <laughs> and i was like man the guy is just like everywhere at once. He's a machine, he but he Man. does a lot of really big gigs. And you as the person fronting his band, do you have like a favorite uh, gig that you've done or a gig story you want to share with everybody? Um, I, the shows that we play over um, in India and that surrounding area, those have been massive. And uh, we did one show in Vishakhapatnam, India. Vizag is the, the short name for it. Okay. And often when I would do a show with Ricky, um, I would fly in. It would take me 30 to 40 hours to get from my door to there. Right. And then finally you get off the plane, you ride with a driver to the, the hotel, and then you change up quick and then off to sound check. Right. And this was one of those things where I got there. I wasn't really sure what I knew it was a festival we we're playing. I didn't know really completely what I was walking into and showed up to sound check. They pull you backstage and step out on the stage. And I'm like, wow, it's a beautiful, large stage. Uh, and we're ready to rock. Sound check's complete. We come out at showtime, we do our show and I look out and there's what appears to be maybe 20,000 people in front of me. Oh my God. <laughs> disappeared off in like the people just kept going and they just disappeared off into darkness oh my god and it was a beach festival so there's the ocean to the right and a sea of people in front of me <laughs> um and what was really interesting is we did the show it was fantastic it was, it's always a good time to play with ricky um i go home get all the way back to the u.s shake off the jet lag and then we get a message from the promoter and said not sure if you're aware but there were eighty-eight thousand people at that show wow because it's like is that even possible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but that's, I mean, Ricky's really got quite the following. And uh, every show is not only an entertainment thing, but it's also inspiring and informative. And people walk away just ready to make a difference in the world, which is really what it's all about, what the message behind most of what we're doing is all about. Right. Well, you know, you as you get older, and I, you know, coming from the same Baptist kind of background that you did, eventually I started to, you know, read a lot of the New Age books and, uh, you know, the Esalen Institute and Alan Watts and uh, John Lilly, uh, who was the guy who invented the isolation tank. And there were crazy, wacky books in the late seventies and early eighties and Herman Hesse and all this stuff. And, and so I was ingesting a lot of different kinds of philosophy uh, after kind of getting away from my parents and stuff. But ultimately I look back on that, you know, background that I had, and I'm grateful that it was limited to a certain kind of a thing. Cause I think kids today have this huge, um, you know, a number of options as far as philosophies and behavior patterns and ideas. And I would hate to be young today because at least that kind of grounded me in one direction when later on in my life, we could say, okay, I like these things about Christianity, but I also right. like these things about Buddhism. Right. And, you know, the uh, joke that I make with my friends when they ask me about this stuff, and I never go into this on the show, but I'm in it right now is uh, i say well i'm a buddhist christian you know and they and they say there's no such thing as a buddhist christian how did you come up with that and i said well george carlin gave me that idea <laughs> <laughs> and i said well how did george carlin give you that idea and i said well what george carlin said is you know if you sit up on the tree and you look down in the valley you see this mad screaming mob of people on the left and you see a mad screaming mob of people on the right and as they both start mad screaming and charging with their weapons to kill each other in the center of the valley over their belief systems, I'm just sitting up here underneath the tree watching it all go down. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, so obviously, you know, but you probably get, um, well, I don't even know, but early on when you were first starting to produce where you, I see, you know, heavy metal and stuff in your, in your bio, were, were any of these rock band stories just hilarious? Because I, I remember being in some studios where I was on staff and the death metal guys would come in. And for me, it was really hard not to laugh. And I didn't want to get killed because some of those guys are like big and tattooed and really violent. I mean, how do you manage <laughs> <laughs> How do you manage a death metal session? Um, the same way I do a jazz session. You know, I mean, you're really basically taking the artist in interpreting what it is they do in the best way that you can. And really, I think that there are a lot of producers out there that are incredible at one specific genre and they've made an entire career like Michael Wagner, brilliant producer. Uh, he was the heavy metal guy. Okay. Uh, and he, he just had an incredible career focused on that genre. Of course he did stuff left and right, but everybody knows him for that work. Okay. Whereas in my particular case, because of where I come from and because of the clients that were coming to me, there's always been diversity since the beginning. So I didn't necessarily think, wow, I'm all over the map. I just would come in. All right, what are we working on today? And then I would do my research. So if we're doing a heavy metal record today, death metal, let's say death okay. metal, record, I would go study up on it, see really what it's all about, see what they're listening to and what they imagine their record's going to fit in line with Right. And then you've got a basis to start. And the same thing on a on a children's album or a, a classical thing or whatever it might be. If you do your homework and come in prepared, it's really the same concepts. That's a great, uh, great point that you just shared, because being able to do all of those different things and having the preparation and putting the time in there. But, you know, just for the sake of some of the younger people that watch my show, how do you get to where you're good at producing children's and then you're also good at producing jazz and you're also good at producing metal and you're also good at producing global like where did how did you learn how to do all that stuff um just by doing it and you you are and still today the thing i enjoy the most about what i do every day is i'm learning every day 
Mm -hmm. And again, I didn't, I didn't start early, go to an amazing studio or school where they brought me from zero to a hundred. And I just came out of the gate. Brilliant. Um, I had to work for everything that I've done. And I, I had to learn like, even where do you place a microphone on a, on a 412 cabinet? Um, and you know, how do you record vocals? How do you do all these things? Once you learn all those principles, they're applied across every genre. Okay. Uh, you know, of course you, you make adaptions either way, but really once you learn the principles of recording and a lot of it to me, isn't necessarily about capturing that instrument or capturing that piano. It's about me and you connecting me and the artist. And if we're on the same page and we're clicking, then we get there. So, you know, the artist goes, here's what, where I want to go. And then I bring in my picture <clears throat> of what I'm seeing overall. Once I've kind of absorbed who they are and what they're trying to be, mm. that's where we get the whole picture. And my job is to put it all together. Right. But it's really about us connecting. As long as we're working together, it, it just happens. Well, I, I have, speaking of clicking, I have a really quick, funny studio story from 1980 in American Recording Studios in Denver, where I made my first album. We had this girl singer out there who had huge dreadlocks, and um, she and I were in a little casual band. It was my first album. My drummer had raised the money, and she's out there singing the lead vocal, and we keep hearing this click-clack thing going on, and we don't know what the heck it is, and you know, no, you bet. Try it again. There's some kind of weird sound coming through the mic. This went on and on for about 15 minutes. And finally, Dan, who was the, uh, uh, you know, lead engineer, he sent Steve the second out. He said, go sit down by the singer out there in the, in the, the booth. See what's going on. Yeah. And what it was is that she had beads in her dreadlocks Oh, she would get, you know, this thing going and she'd start shaking her head as part of the music and the dreadlocks, the beads were clacking together <laughs> and, <laughs> and making this funny, funny noise. And, you know, sometimes the the unexpected can, you know, really make you laugh. Well, you play the piano and you play the guitar and, and Ricky's thing. Are you singing too? Uh, are you a lead singer? Kind of like a. Carmen Grillo kind of guy where you sing lead and you play guitar at the same time? Yeah, when when we play live together, yeah, that's my role with that band is to front the band, you know, speak to the crowd, right. sing lead vocals, and I play guitar when some other singer might be playing. I Sometimes see. When I'm playing and singing, depending on the part of the show. Okay, how big a band it, is Ricky's thing? It varies, and he's got various versions of it. He's got okay. an all Indian version of it that does a lot of the Indian shows now mm. um, when we would play <laughs> there were show the smallest shows like when we would do something at the WHO for a special small crowd okay. might be four people on stage okay you know, we'd have percussion and a couple singers and instrumentalists and Ricky the biggest um we did shows where we had like a 500 piece children's choirs but on one side and strings on the other side and wow and, and sitar players and tabla players and you know a flautist sometimes too um and of course me and other percussionists and so it was it can be massive as well it depends on what the the venue calls for do you ever get upset with the sound man because you're so proficient at sound and everything about it and knowing how things are supposed to go. I remember when I was playing with the Crusaders, Wilton Felder, the sax guy, would just really get angry at these sound guys because we'd be at some big jazz festival in Germany and the sound man came from the death metal planet. So yeah. he'd want to spend 15 minutes on the kick drum and then I'd get to Wilton and he would play into the mic and all of a sudden there's you know three lexicons and even tied harmonizer had a rolling space echo all in his sacks and he would just lose it because he didn't want anything. He would just say, take all that stuff off my mic and set to EQ flat. And, you know, it would frustrate him, but I guess you guys travel with your own sound people too, right? Yeah, we do. We do. We travel with our own sound guys, but along that lines, the one thing you, because I wear so many hats 
in the business. You know, I might be a, a session player for a session where I'm not the producer, mm-hmm. or I might be a vocalist, or I might be the songwriter, or I might be the front man in the band, or I might uh-huh. be doing some sound. One thing I've learned is to do my job and let them do, even if they do a poor job, let them do their job. Okay. As long as I hold up my end. Now, if they want my input, I'd be more than happy to help. But I see a lot of people make the mistake of showing up and trying to tell everybody else how to do their jobs. Uh, Right. Yeah. I uh, I may be able to learn something, even from somebody who's not doing an amazing job. I may be able to learn something if I stay quiet and just do mine. That's a, I think you've got the perfect personality for doing what you do because a lot of guys get so worked up about stuff. And when I was younger, I would get worked up about stuff, but even in doing keyboard overdub sessions, when I would see somebody come in, actually not even see them come into the control room, but I'd be on the other side of the glass. I could feel a change in the dynamic of just the vibe of the room and what was going on in the session. Somehow I could sense that something had changed and the new person coming in could, you know, make my day even better or they could screw up the whole session. Do you limit the people that are able to come in and do things Have you ever had to put somebody out in the, you know, out in the barn (laughs) or say, you know, the nearest Starbucks is about 150 miles from here, but I got the Uber covered for you, bro. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'll see you when you get back with your coffee. Yeah. It's, it's important that the room is comfortable. Uh So I rarely have a group of people in here, Uh Uh, especially when you're doing things that really like vocals. When it comes to vocal sessions, maybe the vocalist, me, and maybe one other person. Okay. But you never want a bunch of people just sitting around because they can't help themselves at some point. They're going to interject. And then you're going right. to have that singer listening to three people tell him how to do his job. And right. vocals especially, it's, you know, you can't really fake a vocal. If you're nervous, it comes through. If you're right. uncomfortable, it comes through. When I'm producing vocals, which is one of my favorite things to do, my job is to make that vocalist a really good, impactful storyteller so that it's not about, you know, how somebody thinks they should sing, but does that, does it come across emotionally? Do you have that emotional delivery? Are mm-hmm. you telling the story when the listener's listening? Are they feeling the impact of what it is that's being said, even if it's just a party song? Right. So with vocals, it's really important that they get all the way relaxed and comfortable and they're willing to try some stuff and screw up and completely clam a note just so that they, they're comfortable and they're willing to try. But if there's too many people around going, ah, that was flat. And then somebody goes, ah, it's out of time. What about <laughs> yeah. this note? The whole <laughs> session goes in. Yeah, so I just, I like it to be very intimate, comfortable, chill. Well, it obviously comes across in everything that you're doing because you're brilliant at this at this point and probably have been brilliant for many years before I ever found out about you because I think I found out about you through this uh, little Japanese guy running around the Grammys in a little hat that he would never awesome. take, who would never take off his hat. He looked like he was kind of the Tokyo version of the Green Giant or... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. What was oh, that like... guy? Jack and the Beanstalk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jack and the Beanstalk, Tokyo. I I met him at one of these Grammy things a couple of months ago, and he's a charming, charming fellow. But uh, thanks again, man, for taking the time to just stop everything you're doing. I know you're busy and busy internationally, but just to uh, chat with me about what you got going on. And if people wanted to reach out to you and uh, book the studio or something, um say joe rogan if he wants to try finally take a crack at you know being in over. i think joe over. rogan actually would benefit from working with a person like you because he's not you know he's not that physically demonstrative demonstrative in his podcast but he seems like he's very high strung and internally just kind of like about to blow a gasket at every minute <laughs> yeah but you know what the, I, i'm envious of guys like him because they're so sharp. Like with me, it's more of a slow boil. You know, it's like, 
I got to take it in and then I'll spit it back out. Uh-huh. And he's just, he's got just an encyclopedia in the brain. And you t- even if you disagree with him, he's going to have an educated response of some kind. And then right. he'll make sure he, you know, go back me up um, and he'll look it up to make sure. But I'm just envious of anybody like Ricky, same thing. He's just so sharp. Every time you talk to him, he can recall just about everything about the subject and speak really intelligently about it. Whereas I have to go slow down. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the uh, thing too about, you know, I, I've played in India and I've had to ask a lot of people there to slow down when they're talking because I can't get it all. And then also slow down when they're driving, because I've been on those same back roads drives in India from the airport to the venue. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, where you're, The guy is, you know, driving at a hundred miles an hour and it's nothing to him because he's doing the call to prayer on his yeah. phone right then and you're <laughs> passing all the cows and about to go in the ditch yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so all right man well thanks again uh once again for coming on and folks this is lonnie park grammy winning producer engineer all around chill very chill guy and professional so if you want to go to freeville um I think as long as you're not recording, wanting to record free bird, I think you're probably going to be okay. All right. That's going to do it everybody for another episode of the planet Mullins podcast. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye now.